What if I told you you could get the right outcomes, the right productions out of your breedings? Whether it's the head shape you want, whether it's the feet that you want, whether it's the bone, body, mass, whatever it is that you want on your breed, any breed for that matter. Stay tuned, you're not gonna wanna miss out. We're gonna be talking about dominant genes versus recessive genes and how to get the outcomes you want out of your breeding. Stay tuned, you're not gonna wanna miss this. What's going on, Bully Fam? It's your boy, the educator, the scientist, Mr. Double Muscle Lion Bulls, bringing you another episode of Breeders Hacks. So as I was saying, when it comes to dog breeding, it's all about the productions, all about getting the outcome you want out of your breedings. Well, how do you get that? It all comes down to dominant versus recessive genes, at least in my opinion. If you can understand and look at it with the proper lenses, dominant and recessive genes, you'll be able to get the outcomes you want. A lot of people, a lot of breeders use this for color, but that's all they use it for. And they don't realize to use it for all, everything on the dog, the head, the shape, the body, everything on the dog. And that's why they can't get the outcomes they want out of their breedings. And if you stay to the end of the video, I'm gonna give you guys a little piece, a little gem that you could actually do some more research on this that a lot of people haven't, haven't read that they should read. You're going to want to sit down for this. So before we get into dominant and recessive genes, you kind of need to know what genes are. Now to make it very simple and very quick, we get our DNA from our mother and our father. Now the genes are the DNA combinations that we get from yet again our parents, some being dominant, some being recessive. So with dominant genes, you only need one copy of it for it to be expressed. Uh, meaning you could have two parents, one has blue eyes, one has brown eyes, it only takes one copy of the brown and the kid could end up with brown eyes. Now you take recessive genes, right? And it takes both parents to be carriers of those, of, of those genes in order for it to be expressed. Meaning both parents have to carry blue eyes in order for the child to have blue eyes, if that makes sense. So now the same thing applies to genes when it comes to dogs, right? So there was a doctor of veterinary medicine and what he did, and I found this extremely interesting, was that he was breeding different breeds of dogs. And now naturally in, in today's day and age, we would frown upon that because of the fact that we wanna keep our dogs purebred. But what he was doing was research to find out what genes were dominant and one, what were recessive to get the outcomes that he wanted out of certain things. For example, he bred bulldogs to German shepherds. And what he found was the tall legs in the German shepherd um, being, being a bigger dog were recessive to the short legs of the bulldog. The bulldog's legs were dominant. They were always, those genes were consistently dominant over the recessive genes of the tall legs from the German Shepherd. Now, how does that apply to us as breeders, right? It actually is humongous. It, it plays a humongous part in what we're doing, right? So now that's just in different breeds. Now imagine within the same bloodlines, within the same uh, breed of dogs, there's going to be traits that are dominant and they're going to be traits that are recessive, right? So when I first started breeding, and don't mind my stick figures, I'm gonna cover these up with something else or something. I'll take a picture or something. Just don't make fun of me, all right? Anyway, when I first started breeding the American Bully, I had more terrier type American Bullies, meaning they took more after um, pit bull, terrier type of dogs. It was a, within the same breed, like I said, there's more bullies that are more terrier type, meaning they're more athletic, more shredded up, more longer of a muzzle, um, things like that. They take after more of like a pit bull type of dog, terrier type qualities. Well then, I had gotten into more of a bulldog type of American bully, more of a smashed muzzle, more bone, more, more girth, more mass, and this was the type that I was looking, I wanted more of these traits, right? So I was trying to get away from my terrier type of American bullies and get more into my bulldog type of American bullies, more bulldog type features. So you can have different types within the same breed. But every time I would breed the two together, breed my terrier type of American bullies to my bulldog type of American bullies, I would always end up with more terrier type American bullies. 
and I was so frustrated and I couldn't understand why I couldn't get more bulldog type features out of my dogs. I wanted more bone, a bigger head, more mass, all that stuff. And I kept getting terrier type features. Then after my mentor explaining to me dominant versus recessive genes and giving me some great liter literature from some doctors of veterinary medicine, I understood what my problem was. I'm gonna show you right now. So what I did was after I did these breedings, no matter what, I had to do these breedings. But then what I did was I took one of the puppies from the, from the terrier type bred to a bulldog type I took one of those puppies and bred it right back to another bulldog type, right? And now what did I get that time, right? Because this first breeding, I got nothing but terrier types. So when I took the offspring from these two and bred it to another bulldog type, guess what I got? I got 50% terrier type and I got another 50% bulldog type. Literally, I was able to get half and half. And that's all because of dominant genes versus recessive genes. So the same thing applies to color. A lot of French bulldog breeders use this for color. Like prime example, and I have a video talking about color, is if you take, and you can do this actually with a Punnett square, right? So I'll do the Punnett square for you to give you an example. So with them, it's a little bit different because they go based off of genetic markers um, that actually have like names to them. So I'm gonna use blue for example, right? It's recessive to colors that are dominant, for example, like black. So a dog that may be blue is going to be a DNA wise, lowercase b, lowercase b, and a dog that doesn't carry blue is gonna be like capital B, capital B, right? So for example, if we have a dog that is blue, right? Which is lowercase b, lowercase b, and we breed it to a dog that's not blue, right? But carries one copy of the blue gene, what will happen? So all you do is add a letter from each side. So we got capital B, lowercase b, right here, bring it down, capital B, lowercase b. Here we got lowercase b, lowercase b. Here we have lowercase b, lowercase b. And this equals half of the litter will be blue, the other half will be carriers. So the same thing applied when I was doing my breeding with my terrier types to my bulldog types, American bullies. So all it took was getting some dogs that were carriers, meaning that yes, they were terrier type, but they had a parent that carried the genes for bulldog type. So when I took a puppy off of that and bred it to another bulldog type dog, I was able to get a 50-50 litter. And this is supposed to be percentages. So this, each one equals a quarter. So each one is 25% of what you're gonna get out of your litter, if that makes sense. So with that being said, enough people aren't talking about this. Yes, this is great for color, but you can apply this to any characteristics, any traits that you're really looking for on a dog. With color, um, it's easy because you can, you can test for that. Some of these things you can't test for. Head shape, to my knowledge, you can't test for, but with selective breeding, breeding certain dogs and seeing what they're producing in their litters will help guide you into what genes are more than likely dominant and what are more likely recessive. I'll give you another example. It's like I was breeding dogs and I was trying to get more bone on my dogs, more, more, more bone. And every time I did breedings, I was realizing that it was recessive based off the amount of puppies that I was getting out of my litters. I was realizing it was recessive. So I needed to double up on that recessive gene, breed a dog that carried it to another dog that carried it, and I started getting more bone out of my breedings, more dogs with more, more girth and bone on them. So I just want you guys to be mindful of this. You can apply this to color, but you can also apply this to structure on the dogs. And it even goes as far as neurological things with the dogs, as far as, I mean, that's how a lot of these dogs got to where they're at is based off of dogs that were really good at, for example, hunting or dogs that were really good at catching rats, things like that. You know, things that are also neurological that some dogs that were just smarter than others, you can actually breed for intelligence, believe it or not. So um, in my opinion, it still all comes down to dominant versus recessive genes. And I'm really quoting a lot of this from the doctor of veterinary medicine, Leon Whitney, that really did a lot of these tests on outcrosses, on different breeds and, and seeing the outcomes of what they got and what was dominant versus what was recessive. So when you understand this, like I said, you can apply it to anything on your dogs. You know, down to intelligence, you can breed for better intelligence. 
You can breed for better hunting. Um, you can be, breed for better confirmation, all of those things. And the key with all of this, when you're doing your breedings, especially ones that, for example, like color, you can test for, but head shape and all those things you can't test for. So some of those things to be mindful of is that you write down all your information and data so that it can help you kind of determine what's recessive and what's dominant or what's dominant and what's recessive. Um, that's gonna help tremendously. Writing down, for me, I write down the heights of my dogs, the weights of my dogs, um, the amount of bone on my dogs, the head size on my dogs, all of these things. So that when I breed to maybe outcrosses or different dogs and things like that, I can tell what's dominant and what's recessive. What did I breed to that took away something or added something, things like that, you know? So definitely record keeping is gonna be huge for certain things that you can't um, test for. So if you guys wanna see a part two, you know, please drop a comment down below. I also do wanna shout out, um, this is a great book if you're into you know, dominant versus recessive genes, if you wanna learn more, if you wanna read about all the outcrosses, all the different breeds. I mean, there were so many breeds that were, were bred and were outcrossed and, and so on and so forth. How to Breed Dogs by Leon Whitney. I'll put a link to where you can get the book down below. It's a great read. Um, I don't shout out too many books, but for me, like understanding recessive and dominant genes, this is pretty helpful. Um, and that's what this doctor of veterinary medicine did. And I talk about some other cool real tips and tricks as well. So I just wanted to share this quickly with you. Um, if you guys want me to go into a part two, I'll be more than willing to. Just drop a comment down below and let me know your experience on this. Let me know what you guys think about this, you know, um, as breeders. So I hope this information is helpful as always. I hope it's useful and I'll see you guys on the next episode of Breeders Hacks. All right, guys.